Coming up this evening live from New York City, the Twitter whistleblower gives a bombshell testimony before Congress. He says Twitter is endangering national security. Stock market plunged today after fresh consumer price data. Inflation eased a little bit, but still higher than expected. We have analysis. And more companies laying off workers. Rent, The Runway, and Goldman Sachs are the latest to announce the news. That and much more coming up on NTD Business. Great to have you with us. Don Ma here for NTD Business. Twitter whistleblower Peter Zatko testified before Congress today about Twitter's major security problems. Twitter leadership is misleading the public, lawmakers, regulators, and even its own board of directors. What I discovered when I joined Twitter was that this enormously influential company was over a decade behind industry security standards. Satko was Twitter's former head of security. He says he was shocked by Twitter's loose security policies. Let's take a look at what's at stake here. Just, uh, just give me 30 seconds on the type of information sure, that sure. Twitter has on the average Twitter user. Sure. Um, what's the phone number? What's the latest IP address they've, they've uh, connected from? Are there other IP address they've connected from? Is this the uh, current email? How long have they been using that email with the account? What are the prior emails uh, for it from the IP address? There is a where do we think they live? Um, where do they, we think they're connected to right now? Are they still connected even if they're not actively using uh, the information? What type of device uh, are they connected with? Um, what type of web browser are they using? Which brand is it possibly? Which computer? What language did they connect in it? In addition, Zatko says Twitter also knows where you are at every moment. It knows all your Twitter accounts and which accounts you have on all other social media platforms. Half of Twitter's employees have access to this information and can retrieve it in minutes. A big bombshell revelation is that there's no central logging system at Twitter. Logging refers to making a systematic recording of events. For example, if you check into a hotel, the hotel's computer system records the day and time you check in. But according to Zatko, Twitter's internal systems don't do this. So employees and even potential foreign agents could do things in the system and Twitter won't know who was doing what. If they go into Senator Grassley's account, if an engineer does, for example, Twitter doesn't know that that engineer has done that. Is that correct? It would be difficult to find the logs showing that. Is my understanding correct? Okay. So you don't have a log in and log out system? There was not an easy ability for me to find which engineers had logged into which systems and what, and what data that they had accessed. Okay. So this engineer... Who, who can secretly go into Senator Grassley's account and get all this information. Um, Twitter has no idea what the hell he's, that, that engineer is going to do with that information, does it? Under the hood, no. The sensitive personal information of anyone, like the senators in the hearing, law enforcement, and American citizens could be potentially sold to adversaries. And deleting your account, unfortunately, won't fully de- delete your data either, Zatko says. Because the systems are so disorganized, even if you delete your Twitter account, the data is still there. Twitter engineers themselves won't be able to find it either because tracking data is not a priority at Twitter. Zatko's testimony suggests that revenue is one of Twitter's top priorities, even if the revenue comes from the Chinese Communist Party. Companies based in China advertise on the platform. When a user clicks on such an advertisement, they've uh, presumably redirected to a website controlled by the Chinese government, which can collect vast amounts of data and track their location. With respect to pro-democracy Chinese citizens, is Twitter endangering their lives by allowing China to advertise on the platform. The executive in charge of sales very shortly after I joined said, Mudge, this is a big internal conundrum because we're making too much money from these sales. We're not going to stop. We need something that will make the employees more comfortable with the fact that we're doing this. Um, 
figure out how we essentially thread this needle or frame it. Sadko says he was told that there was at least one Chinese agent on Twitter's payroll. When he told an executive that he was confident there was a foreign agent at the company, the executive responded saying, quote, Since we already have one, what does it matter if we have more? Let's keep growing the office. Sadko says Twitter also tried to block him from writing a report on its security. The company that I hired, um, with the knowledge of the other executives and the uh, head of Site Integrity, uh, which did not report to me, but that this uh, independent organization was going to uh, analyze and do gap analysis, uh, the company reached out to me and said, hey, Mudge, Twitter is jumping in and making us open a separate contract and uh, telling us not to provide you the results to, um, uh, to your own work. And meanwhile, during the hearing, Elon Musk tweeted an image of a bag of popcorn. And also, let's take a closer look at how China is advertising on Twitter. Although the Chinese regime bans its people from using Twitter, local Chinese Communist Party authorities are splurging on global advertising on the site. China is Twitter's fastest growing overseas ad market and one of its largest revenue sources outside of the U.S. NTD's Jessica Beatty has more on Twitter's dealings with China and the concerns. Since 2020, Chinese authorities and propaganda offices have flocked to Twitter to buy ads, according to a Reuters review. The ads, often outsourced to Chinese state media, pitched local attractions and achievements to an international audience. Twitter bans political and state media advertising, but allowed these Chinese ads under an exemption. This as Chinese police have increased arrests of citizens who use Twitter to criticize authorities. Twitter whistleblower Peter Zatko's complaint alleges that Twitter execs knew that accepting Chinese money risked endangering users in China. But he says he was told that Twitter was too dependent on revenue from China to do anything other than try to increase it. NTD couldn't independently verify the claims. Twitter denies the accusations. During the hearing, Zatko said employees were disturbed that despite being banned in China, the platform was accepting money from groups associated with the Chinese Communist Party. Zatko also testified about how the FBI told Twitter there was a Chinese agent working at the company. The agent was allegedly from China's main espionage agency. Twitter declined to comment on its sales performance in China, but a spokesperson said the company has never hidden the fact that it does business with Chinese commercial entities. Jessica Beatty, NTD News. Also today, Twitter's shareholders voted to approve Musk's deal to buy the company. The deal is worth $44 billion or $54.20 per share, which is much higher than Twitter's current stock price, around $41 per share. But whether or not the deal will go through depends on the ongoing lawsuits between Twitter and Musk. Musk pulled out of the deal earlier, saying Twitter wasn't transparent about fake accounts on the platform. Twitter is trying to force him to follow through on the deal. A trial is set for next month in Delaware. Musk has gotten permission to use the whistleblower's claims in his case. And moving on, the new iPhone 14 may come equipped with microchips from China according to a new report. U.S. lawmakers are highly alarmed and warn about the consequences. NTD's Tiffany Meyer from China in Focus has more. Apple is debuting the next generation of iPhone, and the device will come equipped with microchips from China. That's according to a South Korean media report. It says iPhone 14's chips may come from Yangtze Memory Technologies or YMTC. The company has links to the Chinese Communist Party. Senator Marco Rubio took aim at Apple over the news, saying the company is playing with fire. He warned that if Apple moves forward, it will be subject to scrutiny like it has never seen from the federal government, adding we cannot allow Chinese companies beholden to the Communist Party and to our telecommunications networks and millions of Americans' iPhones. Congressman Michael McCall says YMTC's ties with the Chinese Communist Party and its military are extensive. He fears that Apple will transfer technology know-how to YMTC and help the Chinese regime achieve its national goals. Both Democrats and Republicans regard YMTC as a national security risk and have accused the company of violating a U.S. tech export ban. 
That's because it sells chips to a sanctioned Chinese company, telecom giant Huawei. A bipartisan group urged the Commerce Department to add the company to a trade blacklist this July, but the effort failed. U.S. inflation eased a bit in August, but was still hotter, hotter than expected. The government released last month's consumer price index data today. The report says prices grew 8.3 percent in August from a year ago. It's down from 8.5 percent in July. A contributing factor to a minor easing of inflation is a drop in gas prices, which have come down from record highs in June. But the drop in gas prices is being offset by rising food prices. Food costs surged 11.4 percent over the last year. This is the largest 12-month increase since May 1979. Inflation numbers are far from where they were 18 months ago, and researchers say it's still very high right now. It's also far from the Federal Reserve's target rate of 2%. And stock indexes took a dive today after the inflation number came hotter than predicted. All three major indexes notched their biggest one-day percentage drops in over two years. The Dow lost 1,276 points, or 3 and 9 tenths of percent. The S&P dropped 178 points, or 4 and 3 tenths of percent. The Nasdaq fell the most percentage points by 5 and 2 tenths of percent, or 633 points. Earlier today, I talked to Tavi Costa about today's CPI numbers and the big market reaction. He says the worst could be yet to come. Costa is the portfolio manager at Crescat Capital. Here he is. Tavi, thanks for your time this afternoon. So this month's CPI numbers are out. I'm curious, what's the big picture here? What's your most important takeaway? I think the biggest takeaway is the fact that the Fed is being forced to tighten monetary conditions when the markets are down this much. I don't remember last time NASDAQ, for instance, is down close to 30 percent and the Fed is actually raising rates by 75 basis points on top of also uh, shrinking its balance sheet by 95 billion dollars per month. So this is quite different than what we saw, let's say, coming out of the, uh, the 2020 crash uh, in March when we saw uh, the Federal Reserve actually announcing they're going to double the size of their balance sheet, basically, uh, and slash rates to zero. We're seeing the very opposite dynamic today. And so it leads me to the conclusion that we're going to see a very significant downturn in the global economy. And I highly doubt that the global economy can really handle this level of monetary and financial tightening. Uh, at, at the valuations that we are and the level of imbalances that we have in terms of the debt imbalances, but also uh, risky assets where they are in terms of price versus fundamentals. And just a little bit on the market, how are you looking at it, the reaction today? Stocks took a dive after the inflation report came in hotter than expected. Well, well, we've been seeing a lot of re-rating of prices in terms of their fundamentals of many businesses. In 2021, we had most of the software companies having issues. And now this is spreading to other things. So most of the companies that are not making any money were the ones that actually suffer in 2021. So that was kind of the growth to value transition that we saw. And this year, I think we're going to see a much worse uh, performance from the mega cap names. So, you know, the Apples and Facebooks and Netflixes and, and Googles of the world, in my view, are the ones that pose the most risk uh, because they have not felt yet as much as the other parts of the market. Um, I also think consumer discretionary is a part that looks quite weak. And that's mostly because companies still have very large balance sheets. And I think the consumer in the U.S. is at a breaking point today, meaning when we look at the consumer, we see mortgage rates where they are at the highest level since they were in 08. You have saving rates being at historical lows. You have wages not you know, keeping up with inflation. Uh, and you have a sentiment from the consumers that is very depressed. So the combination of this is that it's, highly, it's hard to believe that consumption is going to be very strong going forward. So it's going to lead to weaker uh, earnings for corporate earnings in general, weaker margins. Uh, and therefore, I think it's going to lead to uh, a, a further downturn in the global economy as a whole. All right. And we also did see some relief at the pump, I think. I asked you this last time, but again, do you think uh, we're going to see continue to see a downward trend? I don't think so, actually. I, I do think uh, uh, oil markets are, are pretty sustainable, given the fact that the government's selling as much as they've been selling of the strategic 
petroleum reserves and you have China struggling, one of the largest importers of oil, um, and we're still seeing a pretty tight market. So just one example, for instance, if you look at recounts for oil and gas uh, rigs, uh, it's actually contracting on a six week basis for the first time since 2020. Um, and, and oil production is basically flat for the last uh, couple uh, months. And so those are all issues that I think are still going to take, again, long time to be fixed. Uh, and I, I do believe that oil will surprise to the upside, will continue to surprise to the upside. Sure, we've seen a big move this year. And so oil had a big move in 2021. It had a big move in 2022. And so it's not going to be as easy of a move. But I think the trend is higher, not lower for oil, especially. All right. I guess just one last thing. Where do you see inflation next month? Well, that's kind of a crystal ball question. I wish I had that answer. Um, I'm not sure if I can answer uh, in a month on a month basis, but I think I think we'll continue to see inflation uh, still building in the system in different parts. I, you know, just think about one thing, Don. When you have a company uh, being pressured today, the immediate reaction of that company is to then raise the prices of their goods and services. This is a dynamic that we didn't see in the next in the last five to 10 years. And so this change in strategy from businesses is going to be one thing that is still moving uh, along and will still uh, impact inflationary forces going forward. So I'm quite concerned that that's that's really what's going on. It's that uh, uh, there's way too many forces, uh, you know, really impacting inflation here today. And, and to me, it's, it's just the beginning. We're still going to be probably in an inflationary decade. It's going to be a lot of ups and downs. It's not going to be just a straight line up of, of inflation rates moving higher and higher. Uh, but uh, it's going to be, in my view, an inflationary decade, which it begs the question, how do you invest in that environment? To me, it's owning tangible assets at this point. All right. Thank you very much, Tavi Costa, Portfolio Manager at Crestcat Capital. Appreciate you coming today. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. So how do those inflation numbers translate in real life? In an expensive city like New York City, residents are used to paying a high cost of living. But now with inflation, how are some New Yorkers handling it? NTD's Phil Zhou has the story. On a nice sunny day in the streets of New York, a car is parked outside with its doors open, a musician sitting inside jamming to groovy tunes on his guitar. What exactly is going on? I'm learning how to play guitar and sing. I'm a bass player. Jimmy Greenwood is a 63-year-old New Yorker who lost his job during the pandemic. I played bass for 40 years, but I lost my gigs. And during the pandemic, I realized I'm just going to take voice lessons and, and guitar lessons because I got to be able to play by myself. But to make things even harder, Greenwood is feeling the pain from inflation. It's way more expensive. I mean, even the cheapest food is more expensive. Greenwood says because of higher prices, he's spending nearly twice the amount he used to at the grocery store. Man, all I know is I used to go normally spend 20, 25 bucks for a couple of days, vegetables, rice, cheap stuff, and now it's like $45. In the latest consumer report from the Labor Department, the cost of food skyrocketed a whopping 11% compared to the same time last year. That's the largest increase since the late 70s. It's not like things were wonderful in the 60s and 70s, but man, the cost of living was, it was so much easier to, to survive. And Greenwood isn't the only one feeling the pinch. You know, a can of tuna fish, which was maybe 79 cents, you know, is now a dollar something. Amy is a retired public school teacher. Unfortunately, she doesn't live near many supermarkets. And the ones that are nearby are expensive. I mainly shop at Whole Foods. You know, it's very pricey to actually eat from their cold food bar. It's like something like $14 a pound or something. Besides food, the cost of housing, medical care, and cars also went up. Gas was an exception, decreasing to an average of $3.70 per gallon, down from a record five-plus dollars back in June. Phil Zhou, NTD News, New York. And meanwhile, gym owners are still struggling to recover from the pandemic. In a new fitness consumer survey by Upswell Marketing, 31% of gym goers are working out less in 2022. And nearly 27% say they don't have plans to return. Data revealed those who haven't rejoined are because they're trying to find the right pricing promotions 
as well as good safety precautions like enhanced cleaning of the equipment. Some other factors consumer, customers look for in a gym are convenience, new member pricing, and the type of equipment offered. The survey involved people ages 18 and 69 who had a gym membership before COVID-19. And the trend of mass layoffs has two more recent victims. Goldman Sachs and Rent the Runway are changing structure amid a turbulent economy. NTD's Char Marshall has more. Rent the Runway Incorporated said it would reduce its corporate workforce by 24%, primarily through layoffs. According to Bloomberg, the fashion rental service is adjusting to a slowdown in consumer spending and shifts from shopping habits adopted earlier in the pandemic. Founded in 2009, Rent the Runway is disrupting the trillion dollar fashion industry and changing the way women dress through the closet in the cloud, the world's first and largest shared designer closet. On Monday, the company announced a restructuring plan to reduce costs, streamline its organizational structure, and drive operational efficiencies. It's also reallocating resources to continue to focus on customer experience and growth initiatives. The company estimates it will incur total cash charges for employee severance and related costs of approximately $2.5 million. Meanwhile, Goldman Sachs is preparing to lay off hundreds of staffers as soon as next week. A source told Wall Street Journal the job cuts are part of the bank's annual performance reviews that had been suspended during the pandemic. Chief Executive David Solomon mentioned in July that the company is staying cautious due to inflation and tightening economic conditions. Sean Marshall, NTD News. Rent the runway stock plummeted today by nearly 40 percent. Goldman Sachs stock fell 4 percent. And still to come, a Dutch city banning ads for meat products and fossil fuels by 2024. It's over environmental concerns. That and more coming up on NTD Business. Welcome back. A German court dropped a climate case against Mercedes-Benz today. The lawsuit was brought by a green NGO. It sued Mercedes-Benz, demanding it to stick to tighter emission limits. It also also called on Mercedes-Benz to stop production of combustion engine cars by November 2030. This is the first lawsuit by individuals in Germany against a private company for allegedly worsening climate change. Three directors from the NGO argued Mercedes-Benz's impact on the planet harmed their individual rights. But the court ruled there was not enough proof of that, at least not yet. The court did say this could change in the future. The NGO said it plans to appeal, has also filed a similar lawsuit against BMW with a court date due in November. And in the Netherlands, a city is moving to ban ads for meat fossil fuels and gas cars in public spaces. They say this is due to environmental concerns. Here are the details. The Dutch city of Harlem, just outside Amsterdam, has moved to outlaw some advertisements for meat in public areas. It would also ban ads for fossil fuels, fossil fuel-powered cars, and vacation flights at those same public spaces, which include bus stations and advertising columns. The law would take effect in 2024 to honor existing contracts with advertisers. A Harlem city councilor who represents the Green Left Party came up with a resolution. Harlem's proposed ban comes as many environmentalists redouble their efforts to limit or even eliminate animal agriculture, particularly in the Netherlands. The Netherlands is a significant center of animal agriculture, but that may soon change. In June, the Dutch government proposed massive area-specific cuts to nitrogen emissions. The emission standards are strict enough to shutter about a third of the nation's farms by 2030. One Dutch trucker who protested the emission standards told the Epic Times that he thinks Harlem's new rule is part of that bigger picture. Wybren van Haga, a member of the Dutch parliament and leader of a political party, described the ban as an attack on free enterprise and bad for the economy. Dutch media also reported that the country's central organization, representing the meat industry, expressed similar worries about the ban. Meanwhile, many environmental groups are celebrating. The United Nations Food and Agriculture Organization attributes over 14% of greenhouse gas to livestock, 
due in part to methane from gases they emit. Eurogroup for Animals reacts to the ban, saying, quote, This is a great step towards reduced meat consumption and the promotion of more sustainable food systems. Greenpeace UK wrote, quote, The meat and dairy industry is responsible for 19% of global greenhouse gas emissions. So this is good news for the climate. And that's all the stories we have today from the NTD business team and myself, Don Ma. You can follow me on Twitter too. And if you have any news tips or feedback for the show, you can email us at business at NTD.com. That's all for today. Thanks for watching and we'll see you tomorrow.